Welcome. Hello, everyone. We're just going to wait for a few more people to arrive. Whilst we're waiting for people to arrive, I'll do some Zoom admin because it feels you know, like a, a good time to do it than ever. Um, so feel free to have your cameras on or off this evening. We don't mind either way. Um, if you'd like to have um, subtitles, if subtitling would be helpful for you, you should be able to see, depending on the version of Zoom that you have at the bottom, uh, live transcript. It is happening automatically by Zoom. So I apologize for any errors or any words that don't make any sense in the context of the conversation that we're having today. Um, but hopefully it will be helpful to you. If you've got any questions, I'll be saying this again in a moment, but uh, you can either ask myself, um, Dahlia, and I'm gonna be chairing, or Elliot, who should be hopefully the only two people you can message. So if you have any, any particular questions, please do feel free to message Elliot. Okay, so I'm going to, to start. Hello, uh, my name is Dahlia Fleming and I'm the Executive Director of Keshe UK. Thank you for joining us today for this panel around the experiences of kind of so-called conversion therapy. Um, this panel is being made specifically for the kind of the UK Jewish community, but uh, anyone and everyone was welcome to join us. But I just wanted to kind of contextualize why some of the questions might be specifically around the, the Jewish community, although not all of our panelists are, are Jewish. Um, Keshe UK is an education and training charity. We're the only charity in the UK working to create a world where no one is forced to choose between their LGBT plus and Jewish identity. So we work with Jewish schools, synagogues, youth and young adult organizations, and wider Jewish communal organizations to ensure that Jewish LGBT plus people, lesbian, gay, bi, trans, people and our families have the experience they're expecting to have, whether they are in an orthodox, reform, resorty, liberal, cross communal space. And those experiences might be different, but we really hope to ensure that all parts of the community feel that they can do something. So we always start a Keshe UK uh, sessions with some ground rules. And even though this isn't a training, um, I thought we would introduce some of them to, to, to today. Um, the main one is actually presuming goodwill that you are here because you care about the LGBT plus community, you're interested to learn more. Uh, you're not sure how you feel about the LGBT plus community, but you want to educate yourself. And at that point, we are gonna presume goodwill. So if you have any questions and there will hopefully be time for some um, Q and A from you, please just type in the, um, the words that you know, whether you've you know, read them in the newspaper or heard them in a soap, and if there's a different or better way to say them, we can have that conversation. But we really do want this to be an educational space, and that's really only possible um, if you feel comfortable enough to, to say what you're thinking. Um, so please, you know, we're going to presume that you are here with the best of intentions, and that's how, how we're going to go. Um, at the moment, everyone is muted, um, because I think that's how uh, Zoom panels often go best. Um, but, you know, feel free to uh, message Elliot and I any of the comments you'd like to share to, to the wider audience and depending on what they are we might share them with everyone else um, and so yeah if you do have any questions please do message Elliot um, if you do want trans um, subtitles on you should have something that says live transcript um, at the bottom of your zoom screen and um, they are being made automatically from zoom so once again I apologize if there are words that don't make any sense um, but we will do our best and do message either Ellie or I if you do want some clarification on that or if there's anything else that we can do to make this more accessible to you. If you do have any questions, please do message Elliot. So I'm going to just go into why we felt at Cash UK this was so important. And I think one of the reasons is, is that it became really clear at Keshe UK that there was no one doing educational work in the community to understand why these kind of so-called conversion therapies were so bad, right? There was no reason because a lot of people weren't really engaging with the LGBT plus community. They weren't seeing how damaging and dangerous it was. And one of the reasons that we kind of exist, started to exist as a group of volunteers in the community is to help with the educational points that, that weren't really being covered by other organizations and charities. And a few years back, the government did a big survey and 108,000 people um, filled in that survey. And in that survey, 2% said they had undergone so-called conversion therapies. And don't worry, we're going to define what conversion therapy is in a moment. And 5% had said they'd been offered it. Within that survey, we were able to understand from a Jewish context. And in that, 
there were just over a thousand people, whether they were um, cis, so the, the gender that they were um, assigned at birth is the same as the, the, the gender they, they are today, or trans, um, we got some numbers. And out of the, the cis Jews, so LGB Jews, 3% had undergone it, and 10% had been offered so-called conversion therapies, which is double the general population. When looking at the trans community, 13% had undergone it, and 12% had been offered it. Some of those are historical, right? It's not saying that, it, that all of those numbers are, are numbers of pe experiences people have had in the last year, but they are people within the UK Jewish community who have gone through this. And it, and it made it really clear to us already that it was something that, that we needed to be talking about more, understanding more, having conversations about in the community. And even more so than that, and one of the reasons that I'm, I'm sure will come clear, 51% um, had, had been offered conversion therapy um, or had it conducted in a faith-based setting. And 53% had been offered it in a faith-based setting. So it's definitely something that as, as a faith community, as a Jewish community, we need to be, be talking about and understanding it. Before I ask the panelists to introduce themselves, I do just want to give a bit of a trigger warning. I know that there will be people um, here today who may have gone through these kinds of practices. There may be even people who throughout the course of this panel realize that they've been through it. And people are going to be sharing their honest experiences of something that is traumatic. So at any point, if you need to go and uh, take, take care of yourself, uh, do what you need to do, please, please do. We're about to hear some real lived experiences. And although we're going to try and give the best kind of overview of, of kind of so-called conversion therapies, we can't say that we're giving every experience. There are four experiences that will be shared today. They are not talking on behalf of Cash UK. They are talking on behalf of themselves and their own experiences. Um, and I'm really grateful to them for being able and willing to share with us. Um, so on that note, um, Jane, would you please just give a very brief introduction um, as to who you are? Thanks, Dahlia. Uh, my name's Jane Ozan. I head up uh, a foundation called the Ozan Foundation, which works with religious leaders around the world across all faiths, but typically senior religious leaders to tackle sexual uh, prejudice and discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation, gender identity and gender expression. I'm a Christian. I come from the evangelical tradition. I was a founding member of something called the Archbishop's Council, which made me quite a senior member of the Church of England. And I sit on the General Synod. Up until recently, I've been a, 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 an advisor to the government on LGBT issues and particularly on conversion therapy because I led a debate within the Church of England, which called on the government to ban conversion therapy. And I'll be explaining more about that later. In December, we launched the Global Interfaith Commission on LGBT Lives, where senior religious leaders, including many senior Orthodox rabbis and uh, some former chief rabbis signed a declaration. And you can find that at www.globalinterfaith.lgbt and see if you recognise any of the names who back a call for a ban on conversion therapy. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, next, um, Joe, would you please uh, introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Joe Hyman. My pronouns are he, him. Um, I am a Jewish LGBTQ plus activist um, who's worked in the UK community to create better inclusion for LGBTQ plus Jews. I also work at JW3, London's Jewish Community Centre, where I manage their young JW3 programme, but also much of their LGBT plus programming, including regular monthly cafes for young LGBT people. Thank you very much, Jay. Um, Carolyn, please introduce yourself. Oh, you're muted. One sec, we can unmute you. There you go. A good start for me. Uh, I'm, I'm better muted, to be honest. Uh, my pupils would have said that. Um, I'm Carolyn Mercer. Before retirement, I was uh, a very successful secondary head teacher for 20 years. Uh, my trained subjects at uh, church teacher training college were mathematics and divinity. Uh, I'm married with two children and a lovely granddaughter. Uh, and 
Oh, I'm a transistored woman, pronoun she, her, please. And um, last but not least, Shirley. Hi, um, I'm Shirley Clinton Davis. Um, I'm a strategy consultant based in North London. Um, and I grew up in a typical uh, modern Orthodox family in Finchley, um, going to Kinnos and um, Jewish secondary schools and summer camps. Um, and I came out whilst I was at university um, and then underwent uh, conversion therapy in Israel. Um, and I'm now um, out the other side um, and engaged to my fiance, who's a woman. Thank you all very much. Um, okay, so we've said a term kind of, and I, I've said kind of so-called conversion therapies as well a lot. And the aim of, of this is hopefully that you will all be able to have a better understanding about what kind of conversion therapy really means and also the impact. So in order to help with kind of what it means, I'm gonna ask Jane, who is I think one of the world experts on, on it really, and um, to kind of do a bit of an explanation for us. That's really kind, Dahlia. I'm sure I'm not a, a world expert, but sadly, having been through it myself um, and having found myself at the sharp end of trying to call for a ban, I've, I've got to know um, a lot about this term. We say conversion therapy. I'm afraid it's probably the worst label possi possible. It's neither a therapy nor does it actually convert everyone. But it is a phrase that's used as an umbrella term to may, uh, mean a whole range of different um, practices or attempts uh, at practices to change someone's orientation. And I tend to think of it rather simply uh, in an ABC format. And forgive me, I just thought this uh, was probably the best and hopefully most informative way of, of trying to explain it. So A, is, is it is all forms, any type of practice, be it medical, psychological, psychiatric, cultural or religious form of trying to change someone's um, uh, sexual orientation or gender identity. Those practices can range from talking therapies, uh, where you literally um, talk through um, perhaps reasons why the person who's trying to help you thinks you might be gay, to prayer, to uh, far more violent forms, including beatings, um, sadly, even corrective rape, which is still being used in many cultural settings and dare I say even under some religious guise to try and make someone into something they're not. There have been uh, horrendous uh, aversion therapies and electric shock treatments which you'll hear from, from some of our members today but I think primarily the main forms today have been through talking therapies and forms of prayer and exorcism in religious settings. The B in my ABC is for both sexual orientation and gender identity. Now, by that, I mean that this is um, uh, practices that affect the lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender community. And uh, uh, indeed, they also infect people um, from the queer, intersex and asexual communities, too. But often uh, you might have heard the, the term, forgive me, I've got a kitten who's going nuts behind me, um, gay conversion therapy. That only tells half the story. And as Dahlia's touched on, in the government's own research, we saw that the trans community were twice as likely to have been offered and indeed to have been uh, put through uh, conversion therapy. So it's terribly important that we, uh, we involve the whole of the LGBT community. And finally, what is the, if you like, the primary goal? It is always to change, to convert, to cure, or to try and cancel someone's sexual orientation and gender identity. It is a one-way specific focus. And I, I, I stress that because this is the difference, if you like, between exploring in a safe setting one's um, perhaps confusion over one's sexual identity or gender identity, um, and that exploration is important and, sh and necessary. But when there is a change focus, when there is an outcome that's predetermined that you have to be straight or you have to be in the gender in which you're born, that, uh, if you like, provides the prerequisite for what we would call conversion therapy. 
Dahlia, I hope that's short and succinct enough. I'm happy to go into different forms and, and statistical research. I must admit the Ozan Foundation has done research amongst 468 people who've been through conversion therapy. And we can look, it's one of the only studies that's happened which we can tell what, what, why they went through it, what age they were, what they suffered, and sadly what the impact on them was. And I can tell you now, as you won't, you probably won't be surprised to learn, but the impact on someone's mental health in particular, and indeed the level of, of suicide, suicidal ideation, the suicide attempt is extremely high. And it's that harm that we're trying to protect people against. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, for, for sharing that. If people do have any particular questions, please do feel free to message Ellie or I if, if there's anything that you want clarified. Um, on, on that note, I am gonna ask um, everyone on the panel to, to share their story in, in more depth before we go into a, a bit of a QA. and a um, So Shirley, if you um, are happy to go first or able to go first, um, please share. Okay, so um, my story with um, conversion therapy started in my final year, um, sorry, my first year of university. Um, and I was on a trip to Israel um, with um, a young organization. Um, and one of the evenings on the trip, um, we'd come back from a party and we'd had alcohol um, and I was sitting next to one of the rabbis and he was asking me um, why I looked so upset. And um, at the back of my mind, I was thinking that I was upset because I was dating a guy and I knew that I wasn't into him. Um, and because I'd had alcohol, I then told him that that was the case. Um, and then the rabbi asked me, um, whether I was not into the, the guy I was dating or whether I was not into guys generally. Um, and I kind of said generally, um, and that kind of spiraled into uh, various conversations with the rabbi where he was the only person I had confided in. Um, and that led to um, him making a recommendation that he knew um, a therapist out in Israel. Um, and that was how my process started. Um, so I came back from the trip um, and I signed myself up um, to join a religious seminary in Jerusalem and um, started conversion therapy um, there. Um, the process itself um, wasn't traumatic at the time, um, but I guess in hindsight, um, I appreciate the impact it's had on my life. Um, and so it started off basically as a talking therapy. Um, and it was about empowering myself to have more confidence um, because he kind of assumed that my fear of dating guys came from a lack of confidence um, when the reality was just not straight. Um, and as time went on, um, the therapy kind of got more harmful, I guess. Um, he started blaming my mum for working and saying that I hadn't been nurtured um, blame my dad for not being a role model, even though anyone who knows my family, we're a very normal, nice family. Um, and then he started using religion as a form of guilt. And so I was told that I was gay as a test from God and that I should actually be grateful that I knew my test and I knew um, my purpose in life, um, whilst other people don't have that, um, that luck, I guess. And so um, it kind of turned it into a challenge of not wanting to fail my test um and over time that became harder um and the therapy then started to transform into an analysis of uh, my feelings so if i had butterflies towards a woman and um, we would analyze what that meant um so rather than taking that as just adrenaline or whatever um we would look for other reasons as to why i had butterflies um and then when this still didn't lead me to becoming straight um he tried to ask me whether I'd been abused in my childhood and whether anything had happened. Um, nothing had happened, a uh, very straightforward childhood. Um, and so at that point I was sent um, to do a past life regression, which basically is a form of meditation where you're meant to go back into a past life to see where you've sinned um, and hopefully come out the other side straight. Um, and that didn't work. So, um, I came out of that and I said to the therapist, you know, I've been through months of this. I've dedicated, I've, I've moved away from university. I'm in Israel. 
I'm really religious. I'm praying every day. I'm paying thousands of pounds. I'm asking you for homework. I'm doing everything in my capacity to change. Um, I'm hearing all these stories in this religious Jewish community right now about people who have gone through this therapy and it's worked. Um, and you're telling me that there are guys at the local yeshiva who it's working on. Um, please just find me someone. So I just have this evidence to move forward. Um, and he took another six months to try and find someone, which was another six months of thousands of pounds worth of therapy. Um, and the person he found was this woman, Hannah. And um, I said to Hannah, listen, I need to know where you're up to in this process because I'm at my wits end. I'm feeling really low and I'm not seeing the change that I need to see. Um, so I said to her, okay, Hannah, you know, can you kiss a guy? And she said, well, you know, I feel comfortable sitting in a room with a guy. I can talk with a guy. And I said, um, yeah, but can you kiss a guy? And she said, no. So then I said to her, okay, last question. Can you sleep with a guy? Because I thought perhaps it's maybe that's less intimate than kissing. Um, and again, the answer was no. Um, so at that point, I kind of figured this isn't going to work for me. Um, and that was when I quit and had to start building my life up um, and building up a new identity. Thank you for, for sharing that and for kind of going, yeah, telling us the, the process that, that you had to go through and the, the struggles and the conversations. Um, next, we're going to hear from Jane, um, who is going to share her, her story. I can see that her cat has also just jumped on her, so I hope this is an okay time, Jane. No, it's okay. I'm sorry. Um, a little bit of live distraction. He's just learned how to go outside and I've locked him in the lounge, so he's going a bit nuts. Um, thank you, Shuli, for sh sharing what I know, which is a very similar story to my own. I, I grew up as a, um, a very committed uh, young Christian uh, through my own choice, in fact, to a point that my parents were rather concerned about my fervent faith, uh, which was honed in the evangelical church in, in what we call the charismatic part. So it was very um, uh, wedded to the Bible and indeed to what I saw as spiritual gifts. Sorry, this is a, a Christian story, but it basically my faith was my life. And as I grew um uh, well, into my teenage years, I, I basically felt pretty closed down. I couldn't understand what all the uh, fuss was um, um, with all my friends at school uh, being attracted to boys. And I just assumed that one day I would meet um, my husband um, and the, the lights would you know, dim and the music would rise. And, uh, and yet there was nothing. I must admit, I had no idea women could be gay. I lived on Guernsey in the Channel Islands in quite a conservative community. And it wasn't until I was in Paris in my late 20s where I found myself falling rather unexpectedly for a woman. And I thought that this was God's uh, test for me. But as it happened uh, over and over again, I, I began to realise I was faced with the ultimate circle that I could never square. Why would God create me with a desire to love and be loved, to have intimacy, to, to, be, to build a family when the object of my love um, was uh, forbidden fruit and the the challenge of that that burden of that not wanting to talk to anyone about it because I thought I would be seen as unsound took me to a place where I sadly was in hospital rushed in uh, with my body in in complete pain uh, sadly the consultants going through a lot of tests trying to work out why my body was shutting down in places and they just came to the conclusion that I was incredibly stressed I think they knew before I did that the uh, burden of my secret was causing me a, a significant amount of harm. I, um, I suppose the first step for me was coming out to myself and then reaching out to my uh, religious community for help. And like surely I was, um, I suppose, surrounded by people wanting to help me, uh, going into my past, looking for the reason why I was gay. Was it to do with a relationship with my fa my family, with past sexual relationships, which were pretty minimal, were, were there dominant parents and it undermines every single relationship in your in your life but it's done by people who really love you and who you uh, want to be open with because you want to be um, um, seen as being I, I suppose in my case a good Christian girl who was willing to submit to authority 
the prayer ministry uh, would often take me to a place where I knew it wasn't working and therefore I felt it was my fault. And it took me into a very unvirtuous circle of, of depression because I felt that God was giving up on me. There was nothing that seemed to happen. I looked for more extreme forms of prayer. I went and paid for a lot of exorcism and deliverance ministry. I was at this time quite a senior evangelical. I mentioned I was on the Archbishop's Council. Therefore, I was seeking uh, therapy abroad because I didn't want to be recognised in the UK. But I think if I had a T-shirt that said I have been prayed for and given deliverance ministry by by virtually all the main senior charismatics and uh, around the globe, I, I probably have that. But it didn't work. And after years, 10 years of that, I found myself in hospital yet again. Again, my body cracking under the strain, this time knowing that there seemed to be no way out. Uh, sadly, that um, the only thing I was told now I should be would be single and celibate for life. And that felt like a almost a death sentence to me. I became incredibly depressed and uh, for the second time had a, a nervous breakdown. At that point, I really felt that something had to give and I chose, um, I thought, to walk away from my faith and to try and see if the one thing that I craved, which was the love of a woman, would bring me the satisfaction and, if you like, joy and hope that I so longed for. The transformation was immediate. I, I luckily found a, a wonderful lady who I was with for, for eight years. But for more important to me, I found um, the way I interact with God and my faith was just as, as alive and as meaningful. And I man managed to connect with many others who'd taken a similar journey to my own and unpack and go back to, to my scriptural texts and understand perhaps why I had thought um, wrongly or interpreted those uh, texts wrongly. But I think most importantly to anybody who saw me, the fruit of that love was transformational. You know, I went from being literally on death's door to fully alive, someone who just glowed with the impact of love. It cost me sadly nearly everything. I mean, virtually like many LGBT people will tell you, you are often immediately rejected, certainly by your uh, immediate community who all think that you've committed, in, in my case, the unforgivable sin. Friends, family who I've known for years uh, tend to drop you like a stone because they don't know what to say. Some will journey with you and go back to look at why they too believed what they had and perhaps why they need to think again. But it's a new set of friends who I found who are Christian, in my case, and from the LGBT community who helped me rebuild a life. I think I'm strong enough, I'd like to believe, to take that. The trouble is there are so many young people who aren't strong enough and therefore that the only option they see is sadly to consider taking their lives because they see no way out of the hell that they're in. And that's why we need to start talking about this more. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, for, for sharing. Um, there's a lot to unpack, which hopefully we will in the in the Q and A. But but thank you. Um, next, we're going to hear from from Carolyn, um, who's going to share her story. My vicar unannounced, uh, I was in the church choir, ran a church youth club, called to my house when I was 17, 18, and I was clearly distressed. Uh, I told him about my gender issues. The first person I spoke with. And he didn't in any way criticize me. Uh, we, we prayed together for my mental peace, but he'd worked with a psychiatrist as part of his ministry. So I went to see uh, on his recommendation. The psychiatrist referred me to an NHS hospital where this was the so-called therapy. Uh, you may find it distressing in part and don't hesitate to look away. was taken into a room, windowless room, and in the centre was uh, a wooden chair. Also, it was what I later learned was uh, called an epidioscope, a large light that managed to project pictures to the wall in front of me. There was a fan to cool the epidioscope because the light was so bright. 
that made a noise. I remember the noise now, clearly. And as I was sitting there, strapped in, they soaked electrodes in salt water, in brine, and attached them to my arm. They had explained to me that what they were going to do was to inflict pain so that I associated pain with what I wanted to do. But I was sitting there, electrodes stuck to my arm, arm strapped to the wooden chair, and the lights were turned out. You could feel the warmth from the epidioscope. You could smell the salt water on the electrodes. A picture was shone onto the wall opposite, a picture of an item of female clothing. Nothing happened. Second picture, nothing happened. The third picture, and the switch was thrown. My hand shot up in the air. But of course, my arm didn't, because it was strapped to the chair. I cried. Why are you crying, said the doctor. Because it hurts, I said. I didn't mind being hurt if it helped me, if it cured me. The smell of the salt water changed as it was burning. You could smell the burning seawater and the salt. Strange acrid smell in the air. The epidioscope was still going through my tears. Another picture and another picture. And then the pain. And that continued. The referral was to help me, uh, the referral was to cure me, the referral was to give me treatment that made me better. The worst thing was not that, not the pain, not the cruelty, not the barbarism, the worst thing was it didn't work. What it did do though is for the next 40 years of my life, Every time I recalled those episodes, I physically shivered. Whether I was working, whether I was driving the car, I physically shivered every time the thought of that treatment passed through my head. It doesn't now. I can talk about it. Talk about it with some emotion. But I can talk about it. And I'm not going to shiver. Am I cured? Yes, but not through that treatment. I'm cured from that treatment, not by that treatment. Of course, that particular type of circle therapy or conversion practice doesn't happen now. But it's not the type of conversion practice that's the issue. It's the assertion action not to accept yourself and be accepted by your religion is needed. Although I don't shiver anymore, I'm not totally cured from that treatment. I can't be. You can't undo the past. You can only come to terms with it. Also, when I say it didn't work, it did in a way. It taught me to hate, not just that part of me related to gender. It taught me to hate myself. I attempted suicide and what a waste that would have been. I had bulimia, and lifelong self-hatred. Yes, even now. I'm not able to feel positive emotions in the way I should because of it. It's akin to being left-handed in my generation. Religion, not, not the Bible, but religion said that the devil possessed you if you were left-handed. The devil sat on your left shoulder. You had to drive out the devil by strapping a left hand to the side of the body or to hit you with sticks. It didn't work and it caused immense damage to many people. Conversion practice can suppress behavior, but it can't change your natural self. It can damage you. It can't heal you. There's nothing to heal other than self-acceptance, peer pressure, or even peer preference can cause damage. Why does it matter to any other person how I look, how I live, or who I love? Affirmative therapy is what I needed. Someone to say my feelings were valid and for them to provide support. I'm damaged, but against the odds, I didn't just survive, I succeeded. 
but at times I'll tell you it was a very close run thing. I chose to have so-called conversion therapy inflicted on me. Shouldn't have been allowed. It was truly barbaric and the damage is lifelong. Please, please, please don't use it. And if you can help it to be banned, it's got to stop. You're not going to repair me, but you can save countless others who follow on after me. Thank you for, for sharing. And we've actually had a few comments just saying how kind of barbaric, you know, the experience you had was, but as you said, you know, throughout all the odds, you know, you're here and you're sharing and you've survived. And it sounds like you've had real moments of, of thriving. And I think, you know, for LGBT plus people to, to see others thrive, um, hopefully not needing to go through or having gone through such, such trauma, but, um, it is yeah wonderful that you're here with us and thank you for sharing um such a yeah traumatic experience um finally um joe if you um would be able to share your story with us sure thank you dahlia and thank you everyone for sharing your story so far um it's incredibly difficult to share one story especially when it's something as traumatic as this. Um, I really appreciate being in the presence of each of you and being in community with each of you to try and make this ban um, happen in the country. Um, so I, I grew up in the Jewish community in London, as I mentioned, very much part of that community um, to a family that was what you would call machas and kind of, you know, very involved in lots of different organizations and charities and synagogues and you know I was on the track to being a kind of regular normal Jewish boy whatever that meant um, but what that came with was um, a community that, that also didn't speak about anything that wasn't normal that was that was outside of that normality or normalcy um, so I grew up never really hearing about homosexuality um, never really hearing about other um, other kind of sexualities or about transgender people at all. Um, when I did hear snippets in conversations at dinner tables or in family contexts or on television or on TV, it, on TV and television, same thing, but um, it was always in a negative context. So I built this picture in my head um, of what it was to be gay um, or bisexual or a lesbian, it was bad. Um, and as I grew into myself, kind of as I developed into an adult and went through puberty, I began to realize that there was a difference I felt in that, in that kind of early, early years of my life. Um, and it was that I was gay. Um, as I got to the age of 17, um, this came to, I guess, a, a kind of crunch point. What, what, what am I going to do? I'm, I'm 17 years old about to go off to yeshiva to Israel for a gap year program to learn Jewish texts. And what am I gonna do? Um, and at this point when I was 17, I came across a website. Now, for anyone that knows um, Israel National News or Aritz Sheva, that's where I found the kind of the, the advert for Jonah, for Jonah. So it was found on a Jewish news website. I found this advert that said, Jews offering new alternatives to homosexuality. And I saw that and my heart lifted. I was like, oh, wow, that's what I'm feeling. They're offering, you know, an alternative to it. It's called Jonah. I know that story. I grew up in the Jewish community. Let's, let's go for it. I look at the website and I scour through and I read all the articles and a sense of hope, you know, arises within me. And I, and I really want to go ahead and do this therapy. I read about all the other people that went through it, the success rates that were pretty low, about 30% from their perspective, what a success rate looked like. Um, but the stories they spoke about really resonated with me, um, resonated with how I grew up, kind of my, my, uh, my identity. I wasn't a sporty boy. I wasn't a, a masculine boy. I wasn't like that um, in, the con in, in, in my school. So it made a lot of sense to me what they were saying that, you know, gay gay men are gay because they lack that masculinity within their life they lack male friends um you know discussions about parents and different approaches and that and that was really resonant to me at that time so at 17 um i i take the steps 
um, to slowly come out to my parents in an incredibly difficult way, incredibly hard way, but I come out to my parents. And as my parents will probably tell you, I'm quite a um, single-minded person um, in many ways. Um, and I said, look, I'm gay. Um, it didn't happen as clearly and succinctly as that. There was a lot of kind of tears and difficulty. But I said after that, but I have a solution, but I have this, this solution that, that, we, that, we can, that we can go ahead and do. Um, and my parents were unsure and not really knowing what it was. My, my dad was, you know, grew up in a world of electroconvulsive therapy where, um, where he was aware of that going on and was kind of against it. My mum was distressed and really didn't know about this because we didn't grow up in a world that spoke about these things. So in the end, I pushed and I, and I went through it. It felt like the obvious path. Um, so I, I met up with my conversion there, not, 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 not with my conversion therapist online um, um, through Jonah. We began speaking and bear in mind that I had never spoken to anyone else about my sexuality, the details of it, the thoughts I was having, the experiences I was having, what was going on in my head. No one had heard that. So the first time I spoke to the therapist, it was a breath of fresh air. Someone was listening to me. I could, I could feel seen and heard and understood. And, and it wasn't a traumatic experience in the moment. It was very calming. And that went on for a while. I went to Yeshiva and began to realize that I needed something more. It was working in some way because I was feeling calm and happier, but it wasn't working in changing my sexual desires and emotional desires to be in relationship with men. Um, so I asked my therapist to connect me with a in-person therapist. We'd, we'd been talking in Skype um, and on the phone. And I met up with actually, me and Shirley had the same conversion therapist in Israel, um, who I spoke to for a few times. And then I entered into this world of conversion therapy groups, um, my therapy group, just so you, you people who are kind of aware of Israel and Jerusalem was in the old city, um, in, a, in a room kind of near the Mariah bookshop, somewhere that was very familiar and safe for me and felt very comfortable. And I went there um, on an evening once a week um, took a break from my studies and went there um, and there were people there that were married and older and younger and people who were in, in yeshiva as well and the whole rhetoric around all of my therapy was that there was something missing or lacking within my life and I could I could change my sexuality to be talking about it. Um, this went on for about two and a half years a mixture of in-person and online um, therapy until I get to about um, my second year of university. Um, in my first year of university, I come across a video of three young Orthodox LGBT um, people on a Yeshiva University panel. I see them and I realize, oh, that is me. That, that person is me. And I don't know what to do about it. I'm screwed. I'm, I'm trying to go, you know, change myself. It's not working, but I know that's who I am. Um, it was akin to kind of a Moses at the burning bush um, kind of revelation. Um, but I couldn't do anything about it. Um, took me a kind of a year from then, and it just came to the point where I knew that the therapy wasn't working. My sessions were becoming repetitive. It went from a rhetoric from the therapist of um, solving my sexuality, fixing my sexuality, to managing my sexuality. And I was aware enough and, I guess, knowledgeable enough to know that, that was not a way to live a life, to manage one's sexuality. So we left amicably, <laughs> which was surprising, and I, and I went on to slowly, slowly come out um, and, and accept my sexuality. And as Jane mentioned, that moment that happened, that I accepted my sexuality um, and began to share it. That was what I needed. It was what I needed when I was 17. It wasn't, conversion therapy wasn't what I needed back then. Um, and my life began to improve significantly and drastically in that moment. I began to be more open and honest with people around me and my relationships deepened and my happiness and joy in life increased and increases up till today. Um, this therapy impacted me. I don't know if I've gone on over time, Dalia, but I'll, I'll be one more minute. Um, it impacted me hugely. It took the shame that we grew up in, in the Jewish community. And I say we, because I think it's all of us in the Jewish community and then often in religious communities as well. There's a shame around sexuality or being different that we all grew up with. It took that shame, it put it underground and it increased it a hundredfold. Um, it split me up into kind of different parts, my sexuality and the kind of expected person um, that I had to be. Um, it still affects me and I still can't talk about how it's affected me because it's, it's confusing. 
but it's so important to me this en this this ends and this gets banned by um, by the government because no one should go through this. Um, in my time as an activist now working in the Jewish community, I meet people, I meet incredible young LGBT people um, and older LGBT people who have had really difficult lives. And some of them have shared experiences that are conversion therapy. And I hate to say it, but including electroconvulsive therapy, including talking therapies in the context of schools. And that is pretty scary. Um, over the, in, the, in the past year, not year, kind of in the, in the past two years, um, my parents were offered conversion therapy for me again by a local rabbi. It's still happening in our community. And it's actually relatively easy for us to speak up about it and change this. Um, so I implore you to do that. Um, and thank you for listening to me. Thank you for, for sharing. And Joe, you didn't go over time. You're exactly spot on. So um, no, I appreciate it. And thank you um, for sharing. Something that's actually been mentioned that I didn't mention in the introduction is, is one of the reasons that we've done this kind of panel. And this panel is, is quite unusual for Keshet UK. We're usually going in into kind of schools or communal organizations and doing training and and often our training doesn't say this is what you have to do because it's not how we work we really want to work with organizations to find out what they feel they can do but for us kind of so-called conversion therapies as you've heard cause so much harm it was something that we really felt like we had to have a, a red line on we had to have a boundary on but actually two years ago the government had said that it wanted to to end conversion therapy and it used the word end understanding that actually to end it there has to be loads of different things legislative, educational support, lots of different things. And it's been two years and not much has happened. But what has happened is that a lot of people have started being louder about the fact that they really want the government to do stuff, including a lot of uh, MPs across all parties. So that's one reason we really wanted to do this now. Um, and that was just trying to contextualize what, what Joe was saying, that there really is um, a lot of people talking about this more and more. And we didn't feel like there was enough conversation happening within the Jewish community. Um, the point that Joe ended on actually really leads nicely into kind of one of the, the first questions. Um, we find at Keshe UK that a lot of the time people don't really understand why conversion therapy is bad, which may sound ridiculous having just heard your full stories. But a question I have, what, what are the ongoing effects to you, the impact to you of having, having gone through kind of so-called conversion therapies? Thanks, Dahlia. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that I'd actually done some research and forgive me for sending a, a, a chart, which I appreciate the figures are going to be quite difficult for everybody to view. This uh, was the 2018 Faith and Sexuality Survey, where we um, approached um, all, well, as many LGBT people as we could, and we asked them various questions and then were able to identify around 470 people who had uh, felt they'd gone through conversion therapy. And we asked them what impact it had had on various aspects of their life. And uh, you may not be able to read all, the, or, to be honest, if you go to the Ozan Foundation website, you'll be able to find the report to download. But I think it's important for you to say, see, I'll pick out some of the big figures. Um, over half had gone on to be able to have a relationship, but equally a hard, uh, nearly a half had found it hard to accept themselves or indeed to have a happy life. Only a third had said they'd gone on to have a happy life. Is that high or low? You know, two thirds of people saying that they weren't happy. Uh, nearly 60% had had mental health issues. And perhaps importantly, 46% had had to leave their faith group. Now this was across the faiths. And many of them professed uh, that they were still spiritual people, but they were rejected by their faith groups and therefore their families. They'd had to step down from any faith duties. I've heard constant stories of people being told that they cannot work with children. They can't be involved in any form of the religious service. That, uh, that frankly, they, I had one young person who was told they were able to clean the toilets, but that was all. And I'm afraid uh, the impact on an individual sense of being uh, is, is extreme. Now, when we went on to ask them about their own mental health, Again, you'll see the very significant, nearly two thirds uh, said they had suicidal th thoughts. Um, just over under a third uh, had attempted suicide. And one of the things that we obviously can't measure, I'm afraid, are those who have completed suicide. 
But there are various stories. I'm sure Joe, Carolyn, Dahlia and Shuli and myself all know people who've taken their lives. And one uh, that has become very public in the Christian community was of a young uh, teenage girl who took her life because she thought that uh, who she was was an abomination, that she could not see herself having uh, a happy future and couldn't see any way out. And when the coroner looked into the chain of events that had taken her to that desperate decision, he found both the school and the religious leader um, uh, culpable of silence. And I'm going to say that the cost of being silence on this, which so many people choose as, quote, the easy option because it's so difficult to talk about, actually feeds the, the problem for many young people that they think that there is, uh, there is no acceptance. Now, I'm pleased to say that that church has become a beacon church in, in the nation, actually, is a sort of role model as to how to be inclusive. And her mother um, has become a very dear friend and is indeed the treasure of my foundation. So there's the, they're doing extraordinary work. But I just wanted to stress that, that one of the problems is unfortunately the silence of so many uh, on such a difficult topic. And Joe touched on this because that leaves many young people believing uh, the worst rather than the best about themselves. No, thank you. That's, that's definitely something that we found at Kesh UK. Sometimes silence can be better than outright homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, but it can also mean that actually you're not aware of exactly how people are feeling and how people are doing and really ensuring the kind of the well-being of those in the community. In some ways that question kind of um, leads on to the next one about your current, if for those on the panel who, who have or have had um, a relationship to their religion or, or faith. Um, how, how do you engage with it now, um, having gone through this experience? And what advice, how do you think you got to the point of where you are? So if you're thinking about speaking to other people um, in terms of where you are, in terms of your relationship to your, your religion at the moment. Um, Joe, if we can go to, come to you first. Sure. Um, so today um, I'm still someone who loves Judaism and I say Judaism and not the Jewish community um, because I love text, I love learning, I love ritual um, and I was lucky to grow up in a family and a household that the, the joy of the experience of being Jewish you know, luckily outweighed the shame of being gay and I think that's honestly it's luck it, for, for me in this context very few people stay within um, the religion and um, within Judaism, within the Jewish community after they come out. And many, many people leave. Um, and I've seen this in my experience. Um, but for me, it's, it's interesting because Judaism was both the, the stick that beat me, but also the comfort that, that held me in that moment. The, the religious texts um, were a comfort to me at that point, not the religious texts that, that said that gay sex and, and gay relationships were wrong, um, and the rabbis that, that pushed that out there, but the texts about love and kindness and about morality and, and community, um, and, I, and I liked the ritual. I liked, I liked being part of that, and I think it, when I, when I turned 13, I'll give you a little background of, of what happened when I turned 13, I became incredibly religiously observant, more so than what I was when I was younger. I became really enthusiastic about it. For some reason, I thought to myself, if I become more religious, if I pray longer, if I, if I do more, then perhaps God will grant me a miracle and I'll change. So there's a really complicated relationship that I've had with my religion over the course of my life, but it's always been quite clear to me that, that the kind of joy and beauty of it um, was important to me regardless of what a text says and how and how particular rabbis um how particular rabbis interpret it um zoom forward to now and my experience and relationship with my judaism is is different to how it was when i grew up i don't identify as orthodox i don't belong to the orthodox community anymore i've found comfort and space in the Mazorti community and in a community um called hadar in new york where traditional judaism and egalitarianism, equality for gender and people, all genders and sexualities kind of come together in discussion and conversation. And I thought for a long time that I could, I could 
be an orthodox Jewish activist, stepping out of that space for a moment just to breathe made me see that I couldn't, I personally couldn't. And there are lots of spaces outside um, of orthodox communities where uh, it's really wonderful to thrive um, as an LGBT Jew. And slowly, but in orthodox communities, this is happening as well. And my advice for someone who is currently on this journey at whatever age is that no one owns Judaism. <laughs> um, your experience of Judaism or your religion that you're coming here today um, is not anybody else's. You can connect to it in your own way and find ways to see rituals and learn about texts in your own way. Um, and what seems like what seems like kind of a lack of future and possibility for you now, actually there's, there's, there's so much, so much community and space for you. Um, yeah, I hope, that, I hope that touches upon what you were thinking about, Dalia. It does, thank you. Um, Carolyn, um, what, what, what is your response to kind of like what your relationship is um, with, with Rich and Mel? I'm, I'm not a member of um, an organized church. I have been, uh, in, including latterly. Uh, I have a very strong belief in an omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient being. Um, I don't need to and don't want to anthropomorphize God. Um, God is beyond my comprehension. Um, I mentioned that I studied mathematics and divinity. My joke is that, that if I couldn't calculate the answer, I could pray. But of course, what I actually did was applied mathematical techniques to study of the texts. And I found, for me, so many contradictions that I, perhaps like Joe, pick out the bits that suit me. And the bits that suit me is of this loving God, this kind God, this God who wants us all to succeed, to be happy and for our world to be a far more pleasant place than we have made it to date. So my, my belief in a God is very strong. My belief in organized religion is almost non-existent, although there are things even tonight there are things that give me comfort and hope for the future that perhaps organized religion um, is opening its eyes in a variety of ways to what, what really uh, biblical texts are about and, and the, the God that I see um, The particles in our body have existed since the universe began and will exist for the length of the universe. The space between the particles are what joins us all together. That space is continuous. What I do affects other people. That space to me it is God. God is joining us together, not pushing us apart. That's the God that I feel. That's the God that I believe in. Um, I just wanted to add, Zavia, um, um, in this conversation about kind of God and religion, um, just to touch on something that Shirley said before, which was kind of this, um, the lack of surety of, of rabbis and, and Jewish leaders when talking about sexuality and gender, um, meaning that the the thoughts within our head from conversion therapy get exacerbated. I don't know if that re relates to what Shuddy was saying fully, but that relates to my experience. And I think what's difficult is we can, we can share with you how much conversion therapy has impacted our lives. And it may sound to you like, oh, that's just anxiety or that's just difficulty. Or you could, you could really easily break it down into its, into its component forms and think that's not, not a very big deal. Um, but it is, <laughs> um, and, and it's rooted in a lack of addressing the, the text and the texts that, that speak about homosexuality in the Bible. And I think when that's being ignored within most communities um, in, in the kind of orthodox and, and kind of close to orthodox world, that's really, really difficult. Um, and the issue with conver conversion therapy is that it asks you to change your sexuality because of, because of a belief that it's wrong. And when 
communities uphold that belief that it's wrong in some way, conversion therapy will continue regardless of the ban. And it's important to just note that. Yeah, I appreciate that. Jane, what are your, what is your relationship at, at the moment? Thanks. Well, uh, I, I have on my website the phrase unashamedly gay and unashamedly Christian, and I do want to hold those two very closely in tension. I think we tend to put people in, you know, either one box or the other. And uh, I, just as an aside, I remember the first person I braved to talk to um, was my psychiatrist, who I'd been referred to at the Priory. Um, they were wondering why I was under such stress. I hadn't really had the courage to tell anybody. Uh, because I didn't really want to admit it to myself. When I explained that um, the trauma I was going through was because I uh, was gay and this was unacceptable to me as, as a Christian, she looked at me and said, well, change your faith, change your religion. And I remember that horrible sinking feeling of, you really don't get this. I can no longer change my religion as I could change the color of my eyes. My faith is so integral to who I am. And that sort of understanding that unless you come from a faith community, which of course so many those of you on this call will, that this is so core to who we are. And so to have this dilemma, this dichotomy, this sense of being unworthy, unholy throughout your whole life really rips you apart. And so to find the peace that Joe talked about when actually you, for me, I, I actually, sorry, I, I'm, um, when I came out, I thought I was having to walk away from my faith. And if you read my book, Just Love, you'll, you'll realize how foundational that was to me. I had spent 20 years, what I call living by faith, not earning a salary and praying the money in to do things that I thought would make a difference in this world. So to walk away from what I thought my faith was the worst thing possible, but apart from the fact that it was not as bad as killing myself. But finding God, even when I was walking, I thought in the opposite direction, meant that I um, could reconcile those two things. But I had to go back to scripture. And I'm sure it's the same for you. I had to go and look at the context on which so much of that scripture had been written. I needed to understand the translation from the Hebrew and also for me, the Greek in the New Testament and realize how poorly a lot of it has been uh, translated. Because frankly, it's been translated with a mindset that is um, homophobic <laughs> at best. And I also needed to understand it through the lens I, of, 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 of God Jehovah, who's, who, 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 who loves us. And we've, that word is so under, underestimated, I think. And, and we're using such a different um, pair of spectacles to understand each of, of the scriptural stories. But I, I, I'm going to come back to it is so foundational to who, who I am, my faith. There are times where I um, still get triggered uh, in, in worship sessions where I have to leave the church because I hear a piece of music or somebody says something that really brings back too many horrible memories. But my relationship with God is stronger. And I do believe that any of us who've walked through a, a, a valley, who've been through the darkest times of life, frankly find themselves when they're able to come through the other side the stronger for it and able to help others along the same pathway and that's what I think Joe and I and Shuli and Carolyn are trying to do now. And that leads actually into another question that I've got which is for those who are going through kind of so-called conversion therapies or those who have been through it what sort of support do you think they may need what sort of support do you think should be being offered to them? Um, we can go to Shirley first. Um, so I think it's a real tough one. And I do think that the, the support that's needed, um, it needs to be at various touch points. And um, I guess it's, it's not just in the now that we need to think about, it's a more holistic, approach um so obviously acceptance and um telling them they're loved as they are and, and this kind of thing um is a given but i think you know it's also it's preventing them from even getting to that point which we really need to be thinking about and i think you know that comes down to parents educating their kids it comes down to teachers in schools whether it's a faith school whether it's not a faith school um giving children an idea of 
what their life could look like, whether that's through English, history, maths, you know, whatever it is, all the examples we use are always very heteronormative. And so it's giving kids a thorough education and all these touch points, um, you know, religious, um, if it's a care of organization going on to campus, again, opening up for discussion um, and in synagogues and, and places of worship themselves, it's also, um, sh it's they who have to, it's the onus is on them to make sure that people know that they are welcome. And it's, um, whether that's through stickers or signs, um, you know, it's quite, there's a lot of shame involved in having to come out and tell someone who you want to sleep with. It's a very private thing and it shouldn't be something that you have to tell everyone. Um, and so I think it is on those places of worship not to assume that we know because we don't know. It, it's you guys who need to be telling us that we're welcome without, without necessarily having to do anything. I definitely, I definitely hear that. Um, Joe, what are your thoughts about kind of particular support um, for those who have been or are going through kind of conversion therapy? I think, yeah, I think what Shirley said um, about creating that space so it doesn't happen, so that people feel safe and accepted is so important. But I think um, supporting people who have been through conversion therapy should be vital to our community as well. I think that's partly um, what a ban would do. A ban would not just ban it and make it illegal, but it would also put systems in place to educate the country about what conversion therapy is for people in safeguarding positions to be aware of if it's happening in different contexts, so they can stop it. Um, but I think within our community and our own Jewish community, um, people like me, people like Shirley who have been through conversion therapy, there's no recourse after that to get support from our community. There's no support groups. Often it's rabbinical figures or leaders that are, um, that are suggesting conversion therapy to us. Um, but once we've come out, it's all very lovely to, every, to everyone to be like, you know, oh, we accept you now. Everything's good now. We're going to talk about conversion therapy now. Um, but where, where's the support for the people that have put a lot of energy into accepting themselves? Um, I personally still and have, have been through years of affirmative therapy now to grow to accept myself. But where's my community been within that? So I think community owning up to the fact that they're somewhat responsible for this happening under their noses um, and working out ways to remedy that and put funding towards that and put support towards that. Um, yeah, would be wonderful. It would, it would be great if rabbis and leaders who previously would offer conversion therapy as an option would offer actually support and aff affirmation instead. Um, and I'm sure that many do. That's definitely been something that, that I've learned a lot, you know, having worked with Keshe K for a few years now, that so often it is suggested by those who love you, those who care about you the most, those who have good intentions. It's so often not what you see in the movies of the kind of sinister person in the corner. And I think that's why these conversations are so important because they often, something I've definitely learned is that good intentions can lead to horrific consequences. And I think we need to own that. And we need to own that we may have had good intentions, but actually what do we do now? And how do we do that? Um, Jane, do you have anything to add on this in terms of particularly support for those? Well, we desperately need a survivor support network. And it's something that we've been talking about in the Bank Conversion Therapy Coalition. Um, the trouble is not, we're all really stretched, aren't we? And we haven't got the funding or indeed the energy. And it's uh, certainly within the Christian LGBT community, it's been the elephant in the room because nobody's got the energy or indeed the resilience to deal with so much trauma. And a lot of what uh, we're dealing with here is is real trauma that needs typical counselling, you know, sp sorry, specific counselling, and that requires funding. So part of the uh, the legislative ban we're looking for is also an ability to have support for victims so that they can get the lifelong support that they need. Before we go to questions that we've had coming in from the audience, um, a question that I'd be really interested in, in your view on is, We've definitely heard that there is some real hesitation around a legislative ban um, across many different communities, but also within kind of kind of faith leaders. So I'm wondering, like, what, what are your thoughts? And we'll maybe go to um, Joe first. Why, why do you think that kind of some religious communities, religious leaders, Jewish leaders um, are hesitant about a legislative ban around kind of so-called conversion therapies? So we, we're a small community and we've been through our own traumas in across the board. Um, and it's scary when a government body or a campaign is asking 
for intervention to happen within religious communities because we know that interventions aren't always positive and limiting religious rights within countries aren't positive. We can see that's happening in France right now. But as we know in Judaism and in other religions, limits need to be enforced to ensure people's safety. And this would be one of those limits. Um, the worry that people have often is that we talk about prayer and we talk about spiritual guidance um, and how that's used as conversion therapy. Rabbis may be worried, rabbinical bodies may be worried that a ban on conversion therapy will stop them doing the amazing work that they actually do with people, guiding them, talking to them, affirming who they are. That's not what this ban is about. This ban is about giving people who are experiencing conversion therapy um, a chance and recourse to say, actually, no, that's not spiritual guidance. This is spiritual guidance you know, that's put into a space that says you can't be gay. That's not spiritual guidance. That's clear, um, you know, clear conversion therapy. I think it's when we use these wonderful practices in, outside the context of conversion therapy to try and change who someone is, that's when it becomes conversion therapy. So a band would help people like me say, actually, no, that's not okay. And also understand that wasn't okay. And my parents understand and people around me to understand. So it might seem scary, but it saves people's lives like mine, like Shirley's, like Carolyn and Jane's and so many more who have lost their lives to conversion therapy. So I would, I would ask that you push a bit further. Often the religious, um, the religious rights and kind of religious freedom argument is used as an argument to stop, pause, delay. You know, I said in, an, in another interview, you know, if not now, when? You know, we need to think about that um, and think about how we use arguments to slow things down. And actually, let's just probe into and say, what, what, what does it actually mean? What does it actually mean to kind of like reduce our religious freedom to allow people like me to live happy lives and, and safe lives? Does, does anyone else on the panel, because if you have, want to kind of respond as to why they think religious leaders are, are hesitant about the ban, it's definitely something that we're hearing more and more. Jane? Well, I think it's fair to say that there are some who want to still continue practicing it. And the Evangelical Alliance have been very open about that. They still believe they should be able to pray uh, the gay away and that they want to continue doing so. Um, and sadly, um, despite the very significant evidence of harm that's being created so that there is, you know, there are those who want to continue. There are, as Joe has rightly said, concerns around um, what uh, would be included in the ban and what wouldn't. And I think that's why I tried to, to focus at the start about anything that presupposes an outcome, anything that puts somebody on a one way pathway to trying to make them straight or to make them what we call cisgendered or um, to, to align with the, the gender that they were assigned at birth. Um, uh, that has a predetermined outcome and is wrong. Anything that allows someone to explore and to come to a point of peace about who they are is, is godly and good. And I think our faith is a very important part of that journey and exploration. I think that's where uh, peace and happiness lies. But uh, there is a strong difference between the two. And I think it's that that we, we, we need to accept and recognize and, and be clear about in law. I appreciate that. I'm gonna go to a few questions. The first one's gonna be a quick a quick round because actually we've had a question about what year this took place and I and I want to actually caveat this so people would like to know what year your conversion therapy took place there is evidence it still takes place now and evidence has happened very historically and so I'm going to answer this just so that people can know and I'd like you to share but but I, I also want to say that the year this took place only holds kind of so much weight but um we'll go Joe, Shirley, Caroline, Jane in terms of what what year Sure. Um, I don't know what year, but um, I'll, my, my maths will probably be, be choppy right now, but I'm 29 on Monday. It happened when I was 17. So around 11 years ago through to kind of 2021. Um, and just to reiterate what Dahlia said, Gallup, which is an organization supporting people who have been through um, abuse and conversion, conversion therapy specifically as well, that this is happening today. No, definitely, as Jane was saying, there's definitely a more of a support around uh, a need for support and, and Gallup are doing some of that, that right now. Shirley? Um, mine was between 2015 and 2016. So um, my therapy was 
um, three quarters, sort of seventy five percent of it was done online, and then, um, sorry, face to face, and then the other quarter was done um, online and on the phone. Carolyn. Am I unmuted? Yep. <laughs> Just to check. Um, formally, 1964 and 1965. Informally, until 2002, when I aligned my gender presentation and my gender identity. That's when the conversion therapy for me stopped, in that there was a recognition about natural and normal which I'm quite happy to explore if needed. And Jane? Um, so I had my first breakdown in 97 and then um, a second breakdown in 2008. And between those two was when I was doing all my conversion therapy. Um, but I know of stories happening right now of people going through what I did back then. Thank you. So it really does cross uh, many ge different generations and, and very many different communities. A question that we've had is, is there a worry that a ban will be limited to the more high profile forms of conversion therapy and miss out on the low key and often more insidious forms of pastoral care conversion therapies? Um, Jane, you're nodding a lot. Do you want to, to respond? Yeah, I, thank you, whoever asked that question. That is my real concern, is that we will, um, well, in fact, we've already heard it from ministers. They'll say that corrective rape and electrolysis, you know, is all wrong. But actually, the vast majority of the conversion therapy that we've picked up is um, is what I call soft prayer. It's not soft at all. That's has taken, as you've already heard, many of us to very dark places indeed. But my concern and my fear is that, so that the government won't want to tackle uh, the prayer issue and that will leave the door wide open to all the abuse that we're continuing to see today. And frankly, that's the vast majority of conversion therapy in the UK. Does anyone else want to respond to that question? Uh, there's also an issue about excluding uh, trans issues uh, from the ban in that there is, uh, again, the Evangelical Alliance, etc., latching on to this, that if uh, a young person particularly identifies as being trans, that this is a form of conversion therapy if you help them, because really they should be cis and well, they're allowed to be gay, lesbian or bisexual, but you, gender is different. And that is a real issue um, for a number of people. Um, one of the, one question that we've had at the moment is um, how have panelists been able to trust affirming therapies and whether there needs to be more expertise among therapeutic community to support survivors of conversion therapy? Yes. Would anyone like to respond? Perhaps I could just okay. briefly, I think my own story showed that the therapeutic community don't always understand this at all and a part of, it can be part of the problem. Um, luckily, however, I think there's been a growing understanding. I've, I've myself have spoken to the Royal College of Psychiatrists and with the Memorandum of Understanding group, these are all the different psychotherapy groups and psychiatrist groups and um, medical health practitioners who've signed um, if you like, a code of conduct and an ethical statement. There's a lot more understanding about this now. But I do think it would be good to have um, therapists, I saw somebody in, in the chat explain, who, who are skilled in this area and understand the tension between uh, that can exist between faith and, uh, 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 and sexuality, gender issues. And it's something the NHS themselves are starting to get training on. I've done various uh, sessions on spiritual abuse. Um, so an awful lot more needed, but we have started to make some start, I think. Yeah, much appreciated. The, the memorandum of understanding actually is a really, um, a really important document where the NHS and kind of all major medical authorities said how damaging and dangerous this is. But actually often as we've, we've kind of learned, sometimes their voices don't always impact faith communities, which is why us talking about it is, is so important. Does anyone else want to talk about how, how you were able to trust affirming therapies having gone through this? Um, I don't mind going. Um, so um, it's actually very interesting because I didn't think that I was that um, 
traumatized after therapy, but actually being uh, present right now has kind of shown me that the issue that I had after therapy, which was between God and my, and my sexuality, um, I guess that's what I had to rectify. Um, and so it wasn't for, personally for me a, a self-hate or anything along those lines. It was purely um, not being able to logically get my head around religion, God and my sexuality. Um, and to be able to trust my therapist, um, I just, I actually went to a few um, and then I found um, a person who questioned my own thoughts and was able to tie up my own narrative um, in a way that worked for me. So I then was able to get in a piece and um, come up with my own, I guess, solution really, just as I'd created um, a challenge by going down that route, I could then come up with a solution and, and you know, I'm now at peace with my religion and God and myself. Thank you. The only um, affirmative Jay? therapy, oh. sorry, Joe. The only uh, affirmative therapy I have had uh, was one sentence, and that was in 2000 when I saw, uh, after gender identity clinics and various other things, psychotherapy, all of which were not supportive at all. They put as many obstacles in my way as possible. But in 2000, I saw a psychiatrist and I put to him, look, I don't understand why I feel the way that I do. I'm logical, I'm mathematical, I don't understand this. And he rounded on me and not many people round on me. And he said simply, some things aren't meant to be understood. They're just meant to be accepted. And if you had diabetes, would you understand that anymore? He should have said to me, if you've been left-handed, because that would have made more sense to me. Well, I think Carolyn has, we've lost, we've lost her internet. Um, Joe, do you want to, to respond to us? We're waiting. Sure. Um, my trust um, was decimated by conversion therapy. Um, and I think that it's important to note that who we trust is based on what our families tell us and what communities tell us. And that's a huge part um of what works uh, and what makes us feel like we're in a safe space um i trust my current therapist because my life has significantly improved in a completely different way um to that in the conversion therapy environment and that's all i can say but um just let's make a safe space where people can trust who their family tells them to go to carolyn do you want to finish that last sentence before we go into our final question no, sorry about the internet. Uh, we got oh, wind right. up in the, the northwest. Um, no, I, I was just saying it would have made more sense if, if it had been said to me that, that it, it's like being left-handed. Do you understand why you're left-handed? And, and the argument I will put to everybody is that I am natural, I am normal. My hair isn't natural this colour. I wear glasses to help me read. I've got an artificial hair, all of which fits into natural normal on a norm, normal curve of distribution 99.7 percent of the population are normal i am normal the the issue for me has to start earlier than the conversion practice it has to normalize and recognize that how i was born i will take no responsibility for nor will i accept any blame what i have done with that is down to me Thank you. We've only got a few minutes left. So before we kind of summarize, uh, we've we've had a question that was very similar to the question that, that, that I asked you to prepare for, but I, I, I think it's, it's nice that it's, it's better worded. Um, what, and it's just, it's just left on my screen because someone else has asked a question. So I'm gonna go back to the question that I, I prepared. Um, what can our audience do to support individuals who've been through it and to support any action that you think is needed now. And I'm gonna ask uh, all of you, and I'm gonna ask you in the order that you appear on my screen. So it's gonna be once again, Joe, Shirley, Carolyn, Jane. So Joe, if you can go first. If you have not been through conversion therapy, then use your voice, um, write a letter to your MP, email your MP, um, outlining that this has to be ended. Um, if you are someone who has been through conversion therapy, there is clearly a community here for you. 
um, feel you are safe to speak up and, and share. Um, Cash at UK have offered if you if you want to kind of share that you've been through this um, and um, and share your story, then you can email email. I think Dalia, is that correct? Um, but if, if you have not been through this, then speak up to your rabbinical leaders, speak up to your communities and make sure that they're very clear um, throughout the year that conversion therapy is out. Shirley. Um, I completely agree with what Joe said. Um, as he said, email your MPs. Um, I know that Stonewall um, are telling stories on LinkedIn and social media. So keep sharing those stories. Um, yeah, I mean, that's all there is to add really. Carolyn. Two quotes come to mind. Um, one is, all that is necessary for evil to triumph is that good people remain silent. And the second one is from Martin Luther King, who said, in the end, you will remember not the words of your enemies, but the silence of your friends. And Jane. Thank you. I've just popped in the chat there three things. One, you may want to go to uh, www.globalinterfaith.lgbt and read the declaration that's aimed at faith leaders and faith communities, um, uh, that part of which calls for a ban on uh, a global ban on conversion therapy. If you agree with it, you may want to sign it. As we've already heard, breaking the silence is really important. And in your own community and with your own uh, religious leader, you may want to raise the question, what would we do if somebody came out in our synagogue, in our community? How would we react? What would we do to support them? Or would, what would we say to them? And start that conversation. And as Shuli's already sa also said, we, we have a, a coalition that is working together, which includes Stonewall. I, I happen to chair the group, which brings all the LGBT communities, um, survivor groups, academics, all those working for a band together. We have a web website, bandconversiontherapy.com. And uh, if you go there, you can put in your uh, postcode and it will automatically tell you who your MP is and will give you a, a, a sort of a, a performer letter, which you, you can change to, to send to your uh, MP. And if, and I'm assuming you are, if you're on the call, you're a person of faith and you would like to call uh, for a, a ban, please start your letter by saying, I am a person of faith, because what MPs need to hear more than anything at the moment it is is that there are people of faith who believe that a ban is needed and why thank you thank you all for, for sharing and the thing i also want to say is that at Keshe uk we don't really do training as such on, on conversion therapies or so conversion therapies as i said it's quite an unusual event for us but but actually if you still have questions if there are words that have been used tonight that you don't understand if you feel like your community or your school or anyone could do with a kind of even confidential conversation to say, I just don't understand some of the things that were said. Please do get in touch with Keshe UK and we can have the conversation and try to help understand. And, and in general, the conversations aren't as kind of clear cut as for us in, in this way. And, and what we want is to be able to start a dialogue and there will be no pressure for you to do anything. Although, as you said, uh, in, in, in a broader context for this, it would be, be great if you could just start a conversation with your communities start a conversation with your, your local MP, because as you said, there, there really is a push uh, across all parties to, um, to ban this, but actually there really is a, an understanding at the moment that faith communities don't, don't want a ban. Um, and that is, is, is a message that we are trying to understand better and also have MPs hear it a different side to that. Um, there have been a few um, organizations that have been messaged to us. So if, if anything tonight has really impacted you at Kesha UK, we haven't always worked directly with all of these organizations. So I would recommend that you do your kind of own research, but organizations like Gallup, Forum Plus, Pink Therapies, the LGBT Consortium. Um, there are lots of other organizations who are offering as much support as they can. Um, whether you've been through a, a hate crime is a lot of what they're directly linked to. And interestingly, a lot of people have messaged me saying, I can't believe that this is legal. Surely we have laws that already make this illegal. And unfortunately, we don't. So as confident as you might be that it should be, it isn't at the moment. And so if you have other people that you can talk to, please do. If you have any questions, please do get in touch at Cash UK, info at cashuk.org. If you do have any stories that you would want us to be kind of collecting or sharing with others so that it can impact and, and, and be heard um, to MPs and others, please do, do get in touch. Um, and otherwise, Thank you for joining us. Thank you for, to our incredible panelists. 
Joe, Shirley, Carolyn and Jane, thank you for sharing. Thank you for using the energy to, to speak to us this evening. Thank you, Elliot, for doing our tech support. Um, and thank you for everyone for spending your Thursday evening listening. And I really hope that you'll spend maybe your Shabbat talking and maybe your Sunday sending some letters and emailing um, just to, to some people who, who need to hear this. Um, thank you very much and good night. Thank you.